Hello and welcome back to another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Kim Loomis. So Kim, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, first Michael, I want to thank you for inviting me to share today. Um, this has been a real pleasure to be able to do so. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've worked in the field of digital learning since 1999, where I crafted and deployed, believe it or not, an eighth grade math course for students who were retained and couldn't get out of middle school until they earned that credit. Now I have to say I did get to save half of them, all from a distance. So I have 30 years in the field of education and I've spent 10 years in the classroom as a high school mathematics teacher. And then later I held positions in school leadership and central office administration, but you know, 30 years is a good long time. So last summer I decided to retire. And at that point in time, I was the director for online and blended learning here in Las Vegas, Nevada's Clark County School District, where I had provided leadership for the growth of digital learning in the K-12 setting for the last 20 years, you know, in the online and blended classroom, you know, from teaching, designing digital content, professional development, you know, virtual school administration, to managing systems and processes for growing classrooms of the future. It's been a real passion of mine for the last 20 years. Today, though, I hold, um, I have a company that's called i3 Digital PD that helps others across the nation grow high quality digital programs. I would have to say, and I know Simon Simic would be very proud of me, that my purpose or my why statement for doing that, because you know, I am retired, I don't have to continue, but my passion hasn't changed is I love helping educators establish highly actively engaging learning environments so that students are empowered to take ownership of their own learning. I've written numerous blogs. I, I partner with digital uh, content and about, you know, how to really change the pedagogy in today's classroom. I've even authored a book titled Think Outside the Box, which I always push my administrators to do. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of digital learning, but I never in my life had expected a world quite like the one we've been pushed into today. All right. So you've been a school leader with a number of different caps over the past two decades. But, you know, one of the things that's consistent, regardless of what chair you're sitting in, is you, every school year sort of needs to wind up and then the subsequent school year needs to get started. This year, we've had a real sort of disruption in what happened prior to those two events. So it's not sort of business as usual for folks that, you know, have become accustomed to this. What kind of advice would you give to school leaders out there on how they can accommodate how this disruption has happened in terms of the ending of this school year and the beginning of next one? That's interesting because um, I don't know about you, but I was just telling my family a while ago that the last couple of weeks have felt like a year, right? <laughs> Things are rapidly changing and a heavy cloud of uncertainty just hangs over all of us, even as we, we go forward today and try to think about what's going to happen in the future. You know, as administrators and leaders in programs, you've already had to make some really major decisions, right? Like, you know, how are you going to continue to serve students from a distance? How do I prepare my staff? How do I prepare my students, my families? Now, these decisions... I know we're not made lightly, but the one thing that was certain, and I hope that we all did, was that we we made sure that that thought was students first, right? Making sure that we continue forward that continued learning. I always like to say that we had this opportunity. I love digital learning. You know, you heard my passion early, but what I, what I didn't want to see, and, 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 I, and I have to say that some people gambled. I'm from Vegas, so some people gambled. They were hoping that, right, oh, it's only going to be two or three weeks, you know, to wrap up the year, and they, they didn't really think through the process, and, and they were hoping that it would be short, and it ended up being much longer. And it, it's, it's probably going to roll in to, you know, next year as we, as we move forward. But when it comes to distance education or remote learning, there was no one size fits all, right? There is, there is no blue plan or no plan for everybody to hit because every school is unique. Your students are unique. You have a different set of resources that are available to you. You have a different lens in which to plan and implement, right? So it's, it's probably going to look a little bit different for everybody because it's, you, you know, where did you start and where do you want to end? Um, I, I can talk about my two daughters' schools. One goes to the University of Reno. They continued education. She did not stop a beat, right? But then I have another one that's in a local high school that the teachers, you know, they gambled. They thought, well, we'll go these two weeks. We have a third week of spring break. In those two weeks, she got a couple of assignments. Spring break came around. Of course, nobody got assignments. And then guess what? It just went to pot. 
<laughs> you know, and then part of that was some decisions that leaders made, you know, decisions that leaders that said grades didn't matter, you know, we don't want to put too much stress on you. So we have this opportunity right now, these last couple of months to set the stage for distance learning. And some people did a great opportunity of it, others not so great, right? You know, so we had this time where we were trying things out, being flexible, being creative, and it really helped us make that transition and change for everybody. But I'm going to tell you, there were hiccups along the way and people were willing to accept those hiccups because we were all in an emergency road situation. But when we start next year, those it's, I don't think it's going to be acceptable. I think some of the things that happened aren't going to be acceptable, right? Because we should have already set those plans. We've already had those stages, right? So we have, we have, we've already done the trial and error period. So the expectations in the fall are going to be so much bigger. So we've had this time to prepare. So student access should have already been addressed, right? Teacher training and expectations and professional development should have already taken places. So the uncertainty really is going to lie in our schedule. And it's like, how are we going to open things? You know, what are, how are students going to come together? Should we be looking at guidance? Yeah, from national and state leaders, but you know your staff best. Right. So you need to think about that plan for the worst. That's what I'm going to tell you right now. Right. Lay out several different plans, all kinds of things about, you know, how we're going to start next year. I was talking to a mother of five kids. She had a first grader and a 10th grader and three others in between there. And I asked her point blank, would you send your kids back? And, and you know what she told me? And I thought this was interesting because I spent 10 years in the secondary setting. She said, I don't mind sending my elementary kids back because I know that they have a little more control of social distancing. But my 10th grader, I'm really worried sending them back into a large high school where kids are going to do what right? So we must remember that the core business of schools is relationships and learning. And so we want to make sure no matter what, no matter what digital content you partner with, no matter what technology you bring in as a tool, you should never take the heart of the classroom teacher out of that learning process. And that's going to be our key is maintaining that relationships and learning the core business of schools. As we finish out this year, I know that our kids, you know, need those high fives. I wish we can do some virtual rubs on heads, you know, whatever it takes, right? Continue that relationships and learning to finish off this year and open up next year with that same heart in mind. So once we've got next year opened up, one of the things that we um, are relatively assured of, you know, pandemics tend to come in waves. Um, as various states open up in a broader sort of way, there's likely going to be local flare-ups in places. So the likelihood that individual school districts or maybe even entire states have to shut down again for four, six, eight weeks is probably fairly likely as we look at the, the country as a whole. What advice would you give to school leaders so that they're able to make that transition next time around to remote learning in a little more seamless fashion than the sort of abrupt way that we had to do it this time? Well, my first advice is adopt blended learning adopt blended learning, just make it the new learning. Um, years ago, when I first became the director for online and blended learning, I used to tell people all the time that word blended learning would go away because we would just call it education. That's what was going to happen. But it never did. In 10 years, and even as I led, that never happened. So what we need to do as leaders is we need to ensure that your school has identified a platform that all your teachers can load work on and that students can access remotely, right? And the students, you know, have this consistent, I would do it within your building. Pick one platform so that you have a uh, central platform that all kids are on, that all teachers can get professional development on. You want to keep that cognitive load for your staff and your family lo low, and you want that professional development right now, right? I don't, you know, figure out what it's going to look like. Even templates and deployments and consistency and patterns and look is going to really help you as you move forward. Now, your staff may already be using something like Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams or maybe an open educational application like Seesaw or a full-blown LMS like Canvas or a Schoology, but you want to start off with that digital in mind right? Where and how can I deploy it? Think of blended classrooms, right? Think about how I can already set up this remote learning because guys, we always had kids that were absent anyway, right? So this is just another way for them to come in and access that stuff. 
That being said, capitalize on the technologies that you're already using and partner with quality digital partners, right? Possibly you already have some software products that you're using in your building. Those same software products, I saw people that said that, oh, I use this software product in my classroom, but they didn't give it to their kids in the remote learning. And I'm like, why? You already had it established. You had a pattern. You already had a partner in your classroom, right? You could already monitor it from a distance. You had teacher dashboards, right? The other thing you want to think about is if, you, if you're using textbooks, Guys, check out the publishers. Most of them have an online component, right? Many publishers have online interactivity components. They already have assessments. Partner with those early. So when we get in, and, and Lord knows, we'll probably end up in a situation where we might have this remote learning. And some of you already have it. It's just called snow days, right? We had one of those, believe it or not, in Las Vegas a couple of years back. But the key is to maximize those systems, maximize blended learning so that your students and your, your staff are already comfortable with digital learning environments. And I'm a big fan, I will say it over and over again, of partnering with digital content because teachers are great at deploying. They're not great at curating. They're not great at creating assessments. They're not great at, at creating lessons in a digital world. So I'm a big fan. Hey, CK12, Khan Academy, there's some really good OERs out there. And get your staff thinking about that now. How can they partner with that now? So again, I'm a big fan, blended learning, right? I talk about the CIA of blended learning, that's curriculum instruction and assessment. But in the blended world, it's digital curriculum, guided instruction, and authentic assessment. And if we have those already in place, then I think that if we end up having to start in a remote situation, even a 50% or half your kids in a college area, you're already ready to go. And if we end up with a full social distancing, the kids are ready, your teachers are ready, and your families are already ready. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, Kim. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With, and today our with has been Kim Loomis. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.